This happened to me a few summers ago when I decided to take a solo hiking trip in the Appalachian Mountains. I took a deep breath, inhaling the crisp, pine-scented air as I embarked on my adventure. The excitement of the trail ahead had me feeling like a kid again. I overheard some fellow hikers whispering about an old folklore that today I still think was utterly ridiculous, although it did plant fear in my heart for a brief moment. My name is Clive Norwood. I'm a college student, working part-time as a waiter at a pizza joint in my hometown. Hiking has always been my escape from everyday life, but this time was different. The trailhead led me deep into the vast serenity of the forest. A few hours into my hike, I came across a peculiar feature, a side trail that appeared to be recently formed. Quirky messages were carved into the fallen trees alongside this makeshift path, egging me to explore further. After walking for an hour off track, I met an unusual group of forestry workers struggling with their equipment. Philo Mercer, Olivia Caulfield, and Hamish Bradbear introduced themselves and asked if I needed any help. They mentioned they were investigating strange happenings in the area, but didn't elaborate on their work. As we exchanged small talk, we suddenly heard agonizing screams from somewhere nearby. Unsure how to react, the group merely exchanged nervous glances. We all shared the consensus to follow the noise, hoping whoever needed our help had cell phone signal because none of us could make calls from where we stood. Heading deeper into the unfamiliar terrain while calling out made us feel somewhat vulnerable, yet somewhat courageous too. We stumbled upon bloody footprints leading towards what seemed like an intermittent campsite with traces of struggle and havoc lingering in the air. At this point, reality settled in. We understood that something horrendous had occurred. The subtle dread within our group had grown, amplifying the tense atmosphere surrounding us. Each crunch of leaves or snap of twigs added to the cacophony that fed our fear. We split up, hoping to cover more ground and find any clues on what could have transpired. I found myself with Hamish, who shared his family's story about their farm going bankrupt and needing to take a job within the tracking team. As we continued searching, we spotted an improvised wooden trap hole filled with sharpened sticks holding a lifeless body disfigured by puncture wounds. Overcome with horror, I couldn't help but let out a retching sound. With no time to waste and barely any sunlight left, we regrouped with Philo and Olivia. Each recounted their own grotesque discoveries before deciding to cut through the forest to reach a ranger station for help. But it wasn't long before shadows maneuvered between the trees, deepening in size and scope until they revealed their ungodly forms. Cannibalistic mountain men standing with an eerie poise as they blocked our path ahead. Their mammoth build combined with crude weapons carved from the forest itself invoked primal fears in all of us. The first savage lunged for Hamish, ripping through flesh with bone-crushing force as my comrade groaned in unbearable pain. In any other situation, laughter would have been inconceivable. But at that moment, Philo cracked a joke about our attacker's abysmal table manners a delirious attempt to keep his sanity intact as he fumbled for his hunting knife amid chaos. Philo's hysterical laughter snapped me back to the horrific reality of our situation. The mountain men closed in on us, their grotesque faces twisted into expectant grins. This was no time for jokes. We needed a plan. Olivia, having heard the commotion on our walkie-talkie, and realizing the ranger station was still too far away for help to arrive in time, shouted, We need cover! Get to those trees! We darted into the forest, leaving the mortally injured Hamish behind as he was unable to move. I could hear him screaming for mercy as one of the savage cannibals tore through his leg. We had no choice but to push onward, seeking safety among the trees while hunted by these monstrous men. The forest became narrower and darker with each passing second, but adrenaline flowed through our veins. Philo managed to contact a nearby search and rescue team before realizing that their ETA would be far too late for us. We don't have much time. Let's find a hiding spot, he exclaimed. As we searched for an adequate hiding place, 
I couldn't help but feel guilty for Hamish. The disastrous turn of events had turned us all into prey for these abhorrent monsters who seemed to find joy in our suffering. At last, we found a hollowed-out tree large enough to hide in. We quickly scrambled inside and tried our best not to make a sound as we heard our pursuers approaching. The monstrous leader of this twisted pack stalked closest to where we hid. His vicious grin revealed sharpened teeth lined with fresh blood. Hamish's blood, most likely. His knotted beard served as a makeshift nest for bugs that crawled all over him. It wasn't long before he began talking with his underlings in guttural, animalistic tones that told us our frantic running had led them straight toward us. They seemed certain they could still catch us, and that certainty seemed justified as long as we were trapped in this forest with them. As we hid, Olivia whispered to us, Listen, I have a plan. This is a long shot, but our best chance to survive. We need to light a fire behind us while we escape. It will slow them down, maybe even drive them out of the forest. With no better alternatives at hand, we all nodded in agreement. Emerging from our hiding place, Philo used his lighter to ignite a small pile of dry leaves nearby. As the fire spread and advanced towards us, we could only hope it would remain controlled enough to keep them at bay. We continued onward as the heat grew on our backs and heard the enraged cries of the mountain men discovering their hunting ground being set ablaze. Their pursuit grew more erratic, probably caught between chasing their prey and ensuring their home didn't burn down. Our terrified sprint was soon accompanied by the shrill blare of approaching helicopters. Help was finally near. Knowing that rescue was within reach offered us some hope that we might escape these woods alive. Emerging from the dense trees, we found ourselves sprinting across a wide open field just as search and rescue helicopters began touching down nearby. We waved and screamed for help as another team on ATVs came rushing in to cover the remaining distance. The mountain men had halted at the edge of the forest, unwilling or unable to pursue further. The sight of armed authorities seemed to have given them second thoughts about their relentless chase. For once today, luck seemed to be on our side. We were quickly loaded into an ambulance where medical personnel checked our injuries and offered reassurance that we'd be safe. From there, we were taken to a nearby hospital where friends and family awaited our arrival. Over the following days, I couldn't stop replaying those horrifying events in my head. Hamish's screams haunted my every waking moment, and I mourned the loss of a man who only wanted to provide for his family. Then, there was the story Philo shared with members from the press. The entire ordeal had featured on local and national news. Frightened residents who'd long balked at the terrifying legends were now demanding action. We were survivors, not heroes. We'd simply escaped something unimaginable to become living proof of the carnage that existed in those woods. Warnings would be given, and we could only hope that our story would prevent others from suffering as we did. This happened to me about a decade ago. I was driving with my friend Hank Jessup to a remote cabin in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia for a weekend getaway. The cabin belonged to a friend of his named Jedediah Smith. We thought it would be the perfect spot to escape city life for a few days. As we approached our destination, the winding mountain roads turned treacherous. I carefully navigated each turn as dense fog rolled in, reducing our visibility significantly. The narrowed road made me feel even more on edge. We arrived at the cabin by nightfall. It was an old wooden structure hidden within lush forests and an eerie silence filled the air. It lacked modern conveniences like electricity or running water, but we were prepared with battery-powered lanterns and plenty of bottled water. The next day, we decided to explore the area and enjoy nature's beauty. We wandered through tall trees and dense foliage until we stumbled upon a trail that led deeper into the mountains. Feeling adventurous, we decided to follow it. Several hours in, we discovered something disturbing, 
a bloody, torn-up shirt that appeared relatively fresh. Unsettled, we considered turning back, but curiosity got the better of us. We continued on. As we ventured further into the mountains, we found more articles of clothing and discarded possessions, all blood-stained and deserted. Uneasiness crept in as I recalled Jedediah's warning against wandering too far from the cabin. Soon after that realization, we started hearing soft rustling sounds in the distance that quickly turned into faint grunting noises. They didn't sound like an animal or anything familiar. Hank held onto his pocket knife tightly as if sensing immediate danger. The guttural noises were getting louder and scarier by the minute as they seemed to draw closer from behind us. Maybe it's just some crazy redneck out here playing games, Hank murmured nervously. We laughed quietly, trying to calm our nerves. We decided to head back, retracing our steps along the unfamiliar terrain. As dusk approached, we came across another unsettling sight. A body of what seemed to be a hiker brutally mutilated, his limbs scattered around. Our panic increased as we realized we were being hunted. I reached for my phone, but there was no signal. It was useless. In that moment, I recalled my father's advice from years ago. There are some things you can't outrun, only outsmart. I quickly devised a plan to disorient our unknown assailants using Hank's pocket knife and our lanterns. We managed to create an elaborate trap while avoiding being detected. Just as we were about to move forward, our crude alarm system made of branches was triggered by something large and heavy making its way towards us. Terrified at this point, we hid behind a nearby bush and watched as a group of large, disfigured men emerged from the darkness. Their eyes gleamed hungrily in the dim light of the lanterns as they approached the trap cautiously. The grotesque beings were unlike any human beings we had ever encountered. They were missing fingers, had overly long arms, and appeared emaciated with sunken eyes. It dawned on me then that these were the cannibalistic mountain men that locals whispered about, although I never imagined they could be so terrifying. As the mountain men closed in on our trap, it became clear that there was more than one group of them. They communicated through grunts and gestures as if attempting to strategize against us. Sweat poured down my face as I sensed it was just a matter of time before they discovered our hiding spot. Just when it felt like all hope might be lost, Hank motioned towards our rigged trap. One of them had stepped into the noose that suspended him above ground. We seized that opportunity to bolt from our hiding spot, racing towards the cabin as the other mountain men pursued us. The guttural shrieks of rage echoed through the forest, driving us to run faster despite our exhaustion. Pushing us to limits we never knew we had, we sprinted onward hoping we were outpacing our monstrous pursuers. Our hearts pounded as we charged ahead. It was clear that there could only be two outcomes, survival or death. We continued our frantic sprint towards the cabin, the mountain men's enraged snarls fueling our adrenaline. When we reached the cabin, I scrambled to shove a heavy bookshelf in front of the door. Hank dialed 911 his hands shaking as he relayed our location to the visibly disbelieving operator. One of our friends, Lucy, peeked through a crack in the window. She whispered that there were four more mountain men gathering outside, their faces contorted with anger and bloodlust. Why they didn't try to force their way into our haven remained a mystery. Night fell and still no police arrived. It seemed the remoteness of our location was taking its toll on response time. We tried contacting our friends who had gone into town earlier that day, but reception was non-existent. As darkness consumed the landscape, we heard a scream. It was Sarah. One of the cannibalistic mountain men had grabbed her through an open window. Without thinking about our own safety, we rushed to help her and managed to fight off her attacker, but not without consequence. As she fell back into our arms, we noticed the damage. A deep gash on her arm exposed flesh and bone. Seeing Sarah in pain fueled angry determination within us. We needed to survive and hold out until help arrived. When morning finally broke through, 
bringing with it no sign of rescue or relenting from our adversaries, we knew it was up to us to escape this nightmare alive. It was then that Hank remembered his uncle kept rifles locked away in a storage shed nearby. Dividing responsibilities between us, some gathered food from the kitchen while others barricaded weaker points within the cabin, Hank and I carefully ventured to retrieve the firearms. Shaking hands muffled by heavy sweat hindered my ability to wind the opened lock back around its latch. Glancing over at Hank, whose focused expression suggested trouble focusing on the task at hand, it was clear he shared these nerves. The sound of snapping twigs broke our concentration. A mountain man was nearing our hiding place. Thinking fast, we picked up a metal shovel and slammed the man's head with it, knocking him unconscious. We reunited with our friends in the cabin equipped with rifles and ammunition. This simple alteration to the power dynamic present in our horrifying conflict had renewed our dwindling hope. As we prepared to leave, Lucy spotted a police car approaching the cabin from afar. It seemed that despite how weak her call for help may have sounded, somehow it had found a target willing to investigate. Guns raised as we exited the cabin, scanning the immediate vicinity for any potential threats. Apprehensive law enforcement officers remained at a safe distance, clearly startled by the nightmarish environment that awaited them. As we recounted our tales, one cop said there had been multiple reports recently of cannibalistic mountain men sightings. He apologized for not taking Hank's earlier call more seriously. Huddled together under the blankets in an emergency shelter a short distance away, we mourned Sarah and explained the horror of what she'd suffered through as a means of aiding local police forces prepare for more dangerous encounters in this dark realm, now on everyone's radar. The mountain men were eventually captured and put behind bars. Collectively, Hank and I couldn't shake a newfound vigilance against unusual noises at night or similarly disfigured strangers crossing our paths. We knew evil was lurking around every corner, as tangible as the polluted air surrounding us, waiting for its next innocent victim. This happened to me only a few weeks ago. My name is Theodore Benson and I've always been fond of hiking and exploring the wilderness. It all began when I decided to take a hike on one particular trail in the vast, astonishing Appalachian Mountains. As I ascended, each step seemed more enthusiastic than the last. The vivid colors of the leaves painted an exquisite canvas over my head. Conversations with locals rang in my ears, recounting tales of uncharted territories and bewitching mysteries. Of course, I never believed them, merely considering them entertaining folklore. Not far into the trail, a marvelous scent wafted through the air. It was freshly baked bread from Elza's bakery down in town. The memories of their scrumptious treats made me chuckle as I remembered Elza scolding her clumsy husband, Franklin. Strolling further, I came across some peculiar markings on trees that looked suspiciously like bullet holes. Shaking off any concerns, I carried on until I stumbled upon a torn piece of fabric snagged on a branch nearby. As sweat dampened my forehead and matted my hair to my skin, I felt an eerie stillness around me. Gazing at the fabric closer, I discovered dried blood on it, an unnerving discovery. My skeptical nature led me to believe that someone had merely wandered off course and perhaps injured themselves accidentally. Suddenly, there was a scream echoing through the woods. Blood ran cold in my veins, but curiosity overpowered fear. Gradually progressing towards the unnerving sound source, a mixture of curiosity and concern overwhelmed me. Heart pounding in my chest like never before, long-lost paternal instincts started to kick in. Every rustle and snap fueled an even stronger urge for protection as I mumbled to myself, What if someone needs help? What if they're dying? Cautiously proceeding further into the depths of the forest, I realized there was no cell service, an unfortunate isolating reality of nature. As dusk set in, the light dimmed and chilling darkness crept over the landscape. A slight glint of metal hidden deep within the shadow caught my eye, 
and my breath hitched as I discovered a bloodied pocket knife beneath some dried leaves. Alarmed, I began to question my sanity for putting myself in a potentially dangerous situation. All of a sudden, there stood a man before me with sinister eyes and stained clothing, the grotesque image unveiled by the weak glow of my flashlight. He was gnawing on what appeared to be human flesh. A freezing wave of dread washed over me as I realized just how dire this predicament truly was. Suspecting that these horrifying rumors might hold some truth in them after all. Who? Whoa, whoa, who are you? I stuttered, breathless with terror. The cannibalistic man stared silently but menacingly at me, refusing to respond. Fear coursed through every inch of my being as my intuition screamed at me to run, but my legs refused, cemented in place by primal horror. My heart raced as I continued observing this unnaturally tall figure bathed in darkness, his hair matted with blood and grime, and his teeth bared menacingly like a wild beast preparing to pounce. I made an effort to discreetly step back when I noticed the mountain man's group emerging from the shadows. Their haunting gazes bore into my soul as they slowly approached me with malicious intent. Each second felt like an eternity as they drew closer, their horrifying true nature revealed through each gruesome detail that emerged under the dim glow of moonlight from above. One smaller mountain man toting a large shotgun and his comrade carrying human limbs wrapped in cloth like twisted trophies. In a panicked attempt to escape this horrific sight, I reached for my phone to call for help. My hands trembled violently as I managed to dial 911. The sound of the phone ringing echoed in my ears while I tried to speak as quietly as possible. 911, what's your emergency? said the operator. There's a group of people here. They're cannibals, and they're dangerous. Please send help immediately, I whispered desperately. Can you give your location? The operator asked calmly. I don't know. I took a wrong turn and ended up here, I replied, forcing back tears. Somewhere in the mountains. Stay on the line. We'll try to track your location, assured the operator. Just as hope began to fill me, one of the mountain men detected my presence and lunged toward me with a ferocious snarl. Instinctively, I threw my phone at him, only to watch it shatter against his skull. It was futile. They continued their relentless pursuit. I sprinted through the dark forest, branches slashing at my clothes and face. Adrenaline pumping through my veins. Fear drove me to keep moving despite them hot on my heels. Alongside terrifying growls and their howls in the moonlight, another sound sliced through the air. Gunshots. A bullet whizzed past me, making me zigzag desperately among the trees. The man with the shotgun was relentless, but so was I, determined to survive this living nightmare. As another gunshot rang out and a bullet struck a tree just inches from me, I realized that calling for help had been futile. No one would reach me before these mountain men did. Sudden movement caught my eye. Another unfortunate soul trapped in their web of terror. She was cornered by the largest mountain man near a rocky cliff face. Her valiant struggle against him ignited a spark within me, and against my instincts, I took a risk. I charged at the gun-wielding mountain man and tackled him. The shotgun flew from his grasp, landing just beyond the cliff's edge. The girl seized her opportunity, slipping past her captor while he was distracted by the commotion. I tried to scramble back to my feet, but the mountain man's powerful grip clenched around my ankle, dragging me towards him. Desperation fueled my frantic kicks, but each attempt only seemed to make him stronger. Then, a sudden deafening roar filled the air. A helicopter. Its searchlight illuminated the night sky and revealed our horrifying pursuit. The mountain men halted in their tracks, temporarily blinded by the light. Seizing this chance, I wrenched my leg free from his grasp and joined the girl in our desperate flight. The helicopter whirred overhead while we ran for our lives. Gunshots rang out once more but were soon drowned out by the furious rotors above. With each step we took, I prayed for our rope of hope. The first responders who would finally bring us to safety. 
Finally, after what felt like an eternity of running, we stumbled into a clearing where police officers waited with guns drawn. The sight of their badges filled our hearts with an indescribable sense of relief. Their swift actions ensured that not only our safety was secured, but also that of future travelers who might have crossed paths with these monsters lying in wait. The mountain men were captured after a grueling standoff. They'd have no chance to haunt us or anyone anymore. In the aftermath of this harrowing ordeal, I struggled to wrap my head around what transpired that fateful night. I learned that the stranded girl had narrowly escaped death. Her family hadn't been so fortunate, torn apart by those savages to satiate their sickening desires. Every day forward, a solemn vow bound me to her as we each carried the scars of our ordeal. We dedicated ourselves to honoring the innocent lives lost in this twisted tale, ensuring their memories lived on with dignity and grace. And though life had forced us both into the darkest corners of humanity, we found solace in the light of our shared experience, understanding that even in the midst of nightmares, hope could still persevere. This happened to me a few summers ago. I'm Dave Briggs, a pretty average software engineer who loves hiking in my free time. Never had any unusual or frightening encounters until that fateful day. My journey began at Spruce Knob, West Virginia, the highest peak in the Allegheny Mountains. The air was crisp, and the trails winding through tall pines provided great sightseeing. I planned for a two-day hike through the lush evergreen forests and dense fern-filled valleys. On my first day, after a few hours on the trail, I stumbled upon an unsettling scene, a bloodied backpack discarded among rocks and what looked like torn clothing scraps. My curiosity turned to apprehension as thoughts of injured hikers rushed into my head. I decided to seek help immediately. I reached for my phone but realized there was no signal. With urgency mounting, I hastened my steps and picked up the pace towards the nearest ranger station. As darkness fell, I entered a dense forest where the pines blocked out most of the light. A chilling wind rustled the needles above, while distant animal calls echoed through the trees. Tension filled me with each sound in the eerie silence. It wasn't long before I heard something that made me stop dead in my tracks, unmistakable human screams echoing from deep within the woods. Despite feeling paralyzed with fear, I knew I had to investigate. The source of the cries led me off trail and deeper into blackness of nightfall, until finally discovering their source. A horrifying scene unfolded before my eyes. Three monstrous figures hunched over the torn body of a man whose terrified face was contorted in agony. Frozen with terror, as I observed their grotesque feast from behind a tree trunk, I saw them clearly for the first time. These were not ordinary men, but some sort of twisted, mutant cannibals. All were muscular giants with matted hair and overgrown facial features. Their teeth sharpened to points and their fingers elongated, tipped with claws. As the chilling reality of my situation sunk in, urgency replaced fear. I decided it was time to summon the courage to escape before they noticed my presence. I slowly retreated, careful not to make a sound adrenaline coursing through me like a torrent. This was no longer a simple hike, but a desperate race for survival. If only I had someone to help me. I wished desperately for the comforting presence of my best friend Kelly, who regrettably had declined my invitation due to an important work deadline. I knew reaching the nearest ranger station was crucial. The forest around me felt alive. Every rustle and distant animal call set my heart racing. Despite seemingly endless hours evading these bizarre, murderous beings, though still under the cloak of darkness, I finally glimpsed light, a dull ember glow carrying faint hope among the shadows. As I drew closer to what appeared to be a flickering campfire, feelings of relief mingled cautiously with dread. Fires usually meant people, but could they be trusted? Only one way to find out. I approached cautiously from downwind, 
attempting to gather intelligence on the inhabitants before revealing myself. Soft voices murmured just beyond the circle of light cast from glowing coals within a small fire pit. Peering through gaps in foliage, I discerned four figures huddled around the dying embers, all seemingly ordinary humans dressed in rugged outdoor attire, completely unaware of both my presence and lurking danger nearby. My initial instinct was to announce myself boldly and beg assistance. Nevertheless, caution prevailed. For all I knew, these newcomers could have sinister connections to my monstrous pursuers. Their conversation turned lighthearted as someone shared what sounded like an absurd joke. Why was Six afraid of Seven? Because Seven ate Nine. Despite overwhelming terror gripping me moments earlier, a brief chuckle bubbled up through my inner panic. I decided that these hikers must be friendly, and I stepped out of my hiding place to approach them with a mix of desperation and hope. As I did, a sudden rush of movement caught my eye, sending a fresh surge of terror through my veins. The monstrous giants were upon us, stalking ominously from the shadows. Panicked, I opened my mouth to shout an urgent warning, but just as quickly froze, for one among the cannibals raised what appeared to be a hunting rifle slowly to its shoulder, gleaming muzzle now pointing directly at me. My body stiffened, paralyzed with fear, as the cannibal aimed the rifle at me. The peaceful atmosphere around the campfire evaporated within seconds. The hikers turned their heads in my direction, and two of them gasped at the sight of my pursuers emerging from the darkness. Run! I screamed at them, keeping my eyes locked on the rifle-wielding giant. The hikers reacted quickly, scrambling to their feet and fleeing in all directions. The monstrous beings followed them, those who were unarmed giving chase, while the one with the rifle kept its weapon aimed at me. As it neared, I saw that this brute was covered in filth and tattered clothing, an unkempt beard covering much of its face. In that split second when I knew that both I and the hikers were in mortal danger, something boiled up from within me, a primal desire to survive at all costs. As fearful as I was of the monstrosities before me, I resolved not to die without a fight. I picked up a hefty branch from the ground and lunged at the giant with the rifle. The ensuing chaos was a blur. My memory is fragmented by adrenaline and terror, vague recollections of shrill screams and desperate shouts, of limbs flailing and branches cracking. But one image remains seared into my mind, the horrors etched upon the faces of these monstrous men as they descended upon us like wolves upon sheep. The confrontation concluded as suddenly as it had begun. I found myself sprawled on muddy ground, every muscle in my body throbbing with pain. Crawling towards a nearby tree, I tried catching my breath. Amidst my confusion and exhaustion, one thing was clear. Had to find help. Muddy and wounded but alive, I ran through tangled woods without pause or thought for exhaustion or danger. Soon enough, though it felt like an eternity, I stumbled upon a dirt road with tire tracks imprinted in the wet mud. I cried out in desperate relief. As luck would have it, just around the bend came a ranger's vehicle. Halting near me, the ranger helpfully exited his truck and supported my efforts to stumble toward him. What happened to you? He asked, as I collapsed into the passenger seat. The others, I gasped, before explaining as much of my ordeal as I could. The ranger, who introduced himself as Officer Simmons, listened grimly to my account before advising me to rest while he contacted his colleagues for assistance. By the time we returned to the campsite with reinforcements, dusk had fallen and an eerie silence hung over the area. Shivering with cold and terror despite a warm thermal blanket wrapped around my shoulders, I watched as officers scoured the scene for any signs of life or evidence of our attackers. They found nothing. As they loaded me into an ambulance, I glanced back at the desolation and knew no trace of the terrible events that had transpired remained. No cries for help or screams of agony could penetrate that stillness. My heart mourned for those hikers who had tried to save themselves, but met a gruesome end instead. Days passed, 
and police questioned me about every detail of what had happened that awful night. They came no closer to finding those responsible, nor did they uncover any further clue as to their motivation or origin. Despite this seeming lack of progress, authorities assured me they would continue to investigate and do their utmost to bring these inhuman beings to justice. If there was one small piece of comfort in this entire nightmare, it was knowing those brave officers were unwavering in their dedication to hunting down these sinister beings before they could threaten any more innocent lives. My thoughts often drifted back to that ill-fated night and the strange group of hikers around the campfire who found themselves caught in the crossfire between bloodthirsty mountain men and terror filled me. Perhaps I will never know the fates that awaited them, but I am forever grateful that despite their own fears, they attempted to save a stranger like me. I have to wonder, though, had my attackers been human, would they have shown us any mercy? This happened to me about six years ago, when I was traveling alone through the United States. I found myself in a small town named Clearwood, nestled in the Appalachian Mountains. The town, surrounded by thick forests and rugged terrain, had an eerie charm that drew me in. My name is Ezekiel Spencer, and at the time, I was gathering material for a series of short stories focused on life in rural America. Like many traveling writers, my journey led me through isolated and remote locations, which at times could be unnerving, but also authentic. I stayed at a bed and breakfast run by Ursula Thwaites, a friendly older woman who welcomed me with open arms. She filled me in on some local history and mentioned that there had been an inexplicable uptick in missing persons cases recently. The townsfolk had become increasingly nervous as they couldn't figure out the cause behind these disappearances. One evening, after exploring the surrounding mountains and taking countless photographs of the stunning vistas, I returned to my rented cabin. As I reviewed the day's notes and images on my laptop, I heard a faint sound outside. Upon opening my door to investigate, I discovered a man with long, dirty hair and tattered clothes limping towards me across the yard. He frantically called my name, Ezekiel, which surprised me since we had never met before. He introduced himself as Eldon Hoberman, a hiker who had been attacked by some strange men deep within the forest. His description of these men made them seem like something straight out of a horror movie. Pale-skinned mountain dwellers with mangled faces who communicated with grunts and gestures rather than words. We quickly decided to phone for help. However, cell service was non-existent this far up in the mountains. Despite his injuries, Eldon insisted on making his way into town to alert someone about his terrifying experience while I stayed behind to keep an eye on the cabin. As night approached, I sat by the fire, attempting to capture Eldon's desperate pleas and the menace of our situation within my story. I was soon interrupted by a pounding noise on the cabin door. Startled, I glanced through the peephole, only to witness several humanoid figures with twisted faces and blood-stained hands bashing their lifeless fists against the door. Realizing that these were probably the cannibalistic mountain men Eldon had described, I knew it was crucial to get out of there and find help. I jumped out of a window at the back of the cabin and sprinted down a path while clutching my camera tightly in my hand. The grotesque creatures followed closely behind, their guttural growls echoing in between my own panicked breaths. My hope for survival seemed dim as the trail grew darker and more treacherous with each passing minute. In my mind, I pictured Ursula waiting up for me at the bed and breakfast, a beacon of safety I desperately hoped to reach in time. The inhuman creatures continued their pursuit, gaining ground relentlessly. Suddenly I found myself cornered with no escape route in sight. As they closed in on me from all sides, an overwhelming feeling of terror washed over me. Gasping for air, I raised my hands defensively, bracing myself for their imminent attack. With my hands raised in defense and the cannibalistic mountain men closing in, I knew I had to do something or face certain death. I remembered that I still had the camera in my hand. 
In a last-ditch effort, I aimed the camera's flash at their twisted faces and pressed the button, filling the air with a blinding light. I didn't know if it would work, but it was better than nothing. The creatures recoiled as if they had been hit by a bolt of lightning. Taking advantage of this brief moment of disarray, I darted between them and kept running deeper into the woods. My only hope was that they wouldn't recover quickly enough to catch up with me. As I stumbled blindly through underbrush and over fallen trees, adrenaline coursed through my veins, pushing me to run faster than I thought possible. With every passing moment, the guttural growls grew more distant. It seemed like my risky gambit with the camera flash worked after all. Eventually, through sheer luck or providence, I found myself on a well-trodden hiking trail. Desperately hoping that this could be my path to safety, I kept moving forward as quickly as my exhausted body would allow. While making progress on this trail, I suddenly encountered a group of hikers who were returning from their day's trekking adventure. Upon seeing my disheveled appearance and hearing about my harrowing experience with the cannibalistic mountain men, they decided to escort me back to civilization. Together we carefully made our way down the mountainside under the protective cover of our group's size. The hikers lent me their spare phone, which allowed me to call Ursula and inform her about what had transpired back at the cabin. She was at once relieved at my survival and horrified by our friend Eldon's fate. Upon reaching safety at the nearby ranger station, we alerted authorities to the dangerous mountain men who lurked in the woods. I provided a detailed account of my experience and handed over the camera with all its brutal visual evidence. The authorities quickly organized an extensive search and rescue operation, hoping to capture or eliminate the cannibalistic mountain men, but they remained elusive. It seemed as though these demented predators possessed an uncanny ability to avoid capture. In the days that followed, I was reunited with Ursula at the bed and breakfast where she had been waiting for me. We mourned Eldon together and contacted his family to relay the devastating news of his encounter with cruel fate. As the days stretched into weeks, I tried to put the nightmarish experience behind me. My sleep was haunted by visions of those twisted, blood-stained faces lurking in shadowy woods, their guttural growls a chilling reminder that true evil can exist in our world. We returned home feeling hollow and changed by our experiences. Yet we vowed never to forget those who were lost to these monstrous beings. Eldon and everyone else who took a wrong turn into that horrific territory. Months passed since my encounter with those cannibalistic mountain men. Their grisly stories spread like wildfire through hiker communities and local residents alike. The mountain range took on a sinister reputation in whispers shared around campfires and amongst friends at local bars. Despite numerous search operations undertaken by law enforcement agencies and seasoned trackers, no trace of these tormentors could be found. It seemed as if they had vanished back into the dark corners of the mountains from which they had come, leaving nothing but death, carnage, and their twisted legacy behind. I pray that wilderness will one day devour them or deliver them into hands capable of putting an end to their malevolent existence. Until then, let this story serve as a warning for those who venture into the mountains. Be vigilant against evil that may lurk within and never take for granted the safety of the well-trodden path. This happened to me a couple of summers ago. I'm John Kepler, a high school history teacher who loves hiking. I decided to explore the Appalachian Trail, taking a break from the daily grind. My journey led me to Harper's Ferry, a historic town in West Virginia where my adventure was about to take a terrifying turn. Meeting fellow hikers along the way, conversation flowed easily. Sarah Benteen and her friend Mark Bannister joined my hike sharing similar interests. We laughed at each other's terrible hiking stories and bonded over our clumsiness on the trek. The deeper we ventured into the trail, the denser the vegetation became. Suddenly, a pungent smell hit us like a ton of bricks. A few yards away, we discovered human remains. 
Call 911, I hollered, but no one had reception. Panic rose in our throats as we decided to head back together and report the gruesome discovery. As night approached, we set up camp, keeping a cautious eye on our surroundings. We couldn't shake off an eerie feeling like someone was watching us. We kept conversations light in an attempt to ease our nerves. I think it has been years since that poor soul died, Sarah whispered. Don't you find it creepy how untouched their belongings are? Let's try not to think about it, Mark replied with a nervous chuckle. The next morning felt peculiarly quiet as we resumed our hike back toward civilization. Soon enough, guttural shrieks pierced the silence. Animal-like noises that made our hair stand on end. We need to get out of here, I screamed, running through the dense forest, trying to escape this unseen terror. Every rustle seemed to be growing closer until we stumbled upon another hiker, pale and panting, gasping for breath. My name is Lena Volkov. You need to leave this place immediately, she cried. My friends were slaughtered by these... things. They crave human flesh. These words deepened our dread, but we knew we could not leave Lena behind. She joined our desperate retreat, fear propelling us further towards safety. Without warning, a monstrous figure lunged from the trees, scratching at Mark's face. He fell, and we had no choice but to flee deeper into the woods, leaving him fight for his life. This was survival. As we ran, we heard George Fitzgerald's voice, another hiker we had met at the trail's start. Crippled with injury, he hoarsely whispered that these mountain men could only be stopped with a lethal shot to the head. Nightfall enveloped us once more, as more horrifying noises blended with gut-wrenching screams echoing throughout the forest. All around us, leaves whispered dark secrets while malevolent eyes stared from a distance. With Lena and Sarah clutching homemade weapons, I brandished my concealed firearm, a last resort against these cannibalistic mountain men who've chosen us as their latest prey. Our hearts raced as sweat dripped down our faces, and with each crunch of leaves beneath our feet, we wondered whether it would be our last escape attempt. We pressed further into the woods, our makeshift weapons and my concealed firearm offering a fleeting comfort. Sarah and Lena led the way, pausing occasionally to listen, their eyes darting around in search of lurking shadows. Why aren't we calling for help? Lena asked, her voice trembling with fear. Because, I replied, catching my breath, our phones have no signal here. We're on our own. It was eerily quiet and each footstep felt like crossing a thin ice sheet that could break any moment. As we cautiously proceeded, we heard faint groans in the near distance. The mountain men were close. I see one, whispered Sarah gravely. Ahead lay a disheveled man with unkempt hair and a wild look in his eyes. He looked desperate, deranged even. As he stalked towards us, it became apparent that this was one of the cannibalistic mountain men out to torment us. Our hearts pounded rhythmically with each step he took towards us. We hastily fashioned a plan to evade him by circling around through the brush. But our efforts proved futile when another figure emerged from between the trees, blocking our path. Their distinguishable features were evident now. Long, unkempt beards mixed with unbridled ferocity, fueled by some perverse hunger for human flesh. Deciding there was no time to be passive, I fired a shot into the air as a warning. Better them know we had weapons than catch us by surprise later. The gunshot only seemed to spur them further. Three more appeared behind us, towering men wielding crude clubs fashioned from gnarled branches and rusted nails. Bloodstains adorned their filthy faces, an odious reminder of their last meal. We backed away as quickly as we could, without running blindly into another group of these horrifying cannibals lurking in the obsidian darkness. The moon offered feeble light to guide our escape, but we knew it was only a matter of time before we encountered more of them. Our best chance is to find a way off the trails and back to our car, I insisted. Sarah and Lena nodded, bracing themselves for the harrowing gauntlet ahead. We moved carefully, 
keeping a low profile and treading lightly to dampen any noise. As dawn approached, so did the further edges of the woods. At one point we crossed paths with two more cannibals. But this time, we were stealthier, hiding in the bushes until they passed without sparing us a single glance. By sunrise, hope returned to our world-weary hearts. We soon discovered a dirt road that led downhill, closer to where we started. Our legs burned with all too welcome fatigue as we trekked towards safety. Vehicles appeared from behind highway trees. We made it, I whispered, overcome with relief. While waiting for emergency services to arrive, we recounted the horrors of the night in hushed tones. Sarah contacted Mark's family to inform them of his death indirectly, and resolved to provide stronger details once it was safe. As for George Fitzgerald, we would never forget his advice about stopping these sadistic mountain men, a warning that potentially saved our lives. Traumatized by our ordeal but grateful for having escaped with our lives, Sarah, Lena, and I vowed never to venture onto mountain trails again. Instead, we would work tirelessly within our community to warn others about returning home safely from these ever-hungry predators lurking in the distant woods. A nightmare composed entirely from human roots rather than supernatural tales or folklore beliefs. And every year since then, on an evening spent safely within four walls instead of outdoors, amidst nature's shadows and perils beyond human comprehension, we pay tribute to those who had fallen victim to the merciless grasp of these cannibalistic mountain men who still roam these lands. A haunting memory of the night that changed our lives forever. This happened to me about three summers ago, back when I was working as a park ranger in the remote hills of the Appalachians. My name's Kendrick Booker, and I never imagined what I'd discover in those woods. After a long day checking the trails, I started on my way back to the ranger station. The sun was beginning to set when I stumbled upon an oddly dismembered deer carcass. Its headless body lay near the trail, legs mangled, an unnerving sight that sent shivers down my spine. Working late into the evening, I couldn't take my mind off that gruesome discovery. Roger Kiplinger, another ranger and close friend, stopped by for our weekly poker night. We sat down, shuffled the cards, and began our game in silence. Man, I swear this place gets creepier every day, I said with a chuckle, trying to break the tension. Roger rolled his eyes. Oh, come on now. Do you really believe in all those hillbilly tales? Our laughter filled the room as we continued playing poker. Lost in each other's company, we didn't notice darkness enveloping the area outside the ranger station. Suddenly, we heard a rustle near the window. Our laughter ceased as our eyes locked onto shadowy movement just beyond our line of sight. Stay here, Roger instructed firmly before cautiously stepping outside. The minutes that followed seemed like hours as I waited for Roger's return. My gut churned with worry. That's when piercing cries echoed from somewhere outside. Panicking and fearing for my friend, I dashed past the door and into the dark night. Looking around desperately, I stumbled upon Roger's mangled body, barely breathing but alive, leaned up against a tree trunk several yards away from me. Fear painted his face as he gasped for breath. Run! Call for help! He wheezed. I hesitated for a moment, filled with the urge to drag my friend to safety. But knowing I stood no chance alone against whoever did this, I sprinted back to the station. My heart raced as I made the call for backup. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I spotted a grotesque figure that seemed barely human. Even from a distance, its malformed features were visible. Like a primal beast, it was on all fours and began dragging away Roger's barely conscious body into the dark woods. Hours later, when reinforcements arrived, we scoured through the dense forest searching for Roger or any signs of our mystery attacker. 
Upon finding only fragmented traces of their trail, twisted limbs and blood-soaked leaves, it was chillingly clear our chances of locating them alive were only growing slimmer. As we continued further into the labyrinth-like heart of the woods, we discovered scattered remnants of makeshift homes, crudely constructed using rotting wood and tattered scraps of fabric. Strewn across these sad encampments were gnawed bones, abandoned firearms, and skin-crawling decor fashioned from human remains. The gruesome sight told us that we'd somehow stumbled into forbidden territory, home to those cannibalistic mountain men whispered about in local lore, and they didn't take kindly to intruders. Tension grew thicker amongst our group as we pressed on in search of our missing friends. The very air around us felt like it was closing in with every step deeper into this uncharted territory. Vague rustling beyond our peripheral vision kept us constantly on edge as we struggled to decipher whether another attack was imminent or if dreaded anticipation was playing tricks on our senses. Expletive-laden banter bounced around nervously amongst those brave enough to break silence. Hey, Dino, you ever seen anything like this before? Dino responded with a stiff swallow. In all my godforsaken years of service? Hmph, <laughs> not a chance. Proceeding further into the dense and dangerous terrain, we heard a blood-curdling scream that convinced us beyond doubt. The unimaginable horror was far from over. Frantically, we raced toward its source only to receive nightmarish confirmation that our worst fears had begun to unfold. We discovered one of our own, Bennett Collins, had fallen victim to that grotesque figure. Its grotesquely twisted face leered down at us as it tore mercilessly into Bennett's lifeless body. His screams now silenced for eternity. Gripped by panic, we wasted no time in considering our next move. Fueled by adrenaline and the knowledge that we were now being hunted, we turned and fled through the dense foliage. Every shadow held potential danger, and every step was taken with extreme caution. Dino, what do you make of those things? I whispered as quietly as possible while negotiating the most treacherous parts of the forest floor. I don't know, he replied, the strain evident in his voice. But they're relentless and hungry. Unable to suppress our growing unease any longer, we finally accepted that our missing friends were likely lost forever in the grasp of these vile beings. As a group, we picked up the pace to escape this wretched place. All thoughts now focused entirely on survival. Tearing through the undergrowth, we haphazardly navigated what we thought was our path away from danger. Each of us, hearts pounding wildly in our chests and bodies slick with sweat from exertion and fear alike. Dead leaves crushed underfoot felt like brittle bones breaking, every twig twisted beneath our feet threatening to betray us further, every noise a potential alarm warning to our enemies of our presence nearby. We barely registered several more chilling encounters among us, brief glimpses into an unfathomable reality before those unlucky souls vanished from view entirely. These terrifying episodes merely served as reminders of our perilous predicament and fueled our desire even more to leave this nightmare behind. As darkness began to envelop us in a silent cloak of despair, I realized that my phone still clung precariously within my pocket. While I knew its technological capabilities wouldn't help me decipher this alien land or identify those horrible monsters roaming around, it did hold at least one feature that could potentially save us. GPS. Motioning for the others to stop briefly, I switched it on with trembling fingers, hoping against hope for a few moments of satellite reception, enabling us to pinpoint our position and find a way out of this living hell. Initially, our attempts to contact emergency services went unanswered due to the weak signal or complete lack thereof. Unrelenting, we persisted, knowing that we desperately needed help if we had any hope left of enduring this ordeal. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the call connected, and we heard the voice of the dispatch operator on the other end. Spurred by renewed hope, 
we quickly gushed through hurried explanations, emphasizing our dire situation and how bruised and desperate we all were, without ever mentioning our monstrous tormentors in fear of sounding insane. As soon as I get your coordinates, I will send someone out to help you immediately, the dispatch operator assured us through crackling static. Stay where you are and remain as calm as possible. We pressed onward as discreetly as possible, determined not to waste another minute standing still. There was a palpable sense of urgency among our ranks as we prayed for rescue. It took nearly an hour before we felt that we were finally out of immediate danger, though even then, our nerves refused to settle fully. Soon enough, the rescue team found us, ragged survivors clinging to each other in a tight circle among the treacherous woods. Guided back through that twisted labyrinth by expert hands who knew these lands far better than anyone else, we were led away from death's door and sudden extinction lasting well into the night. Although nothing could erase those terrible memories etched permanently into our minds, images of Bennett's lifeless body or glimpses of cannibalistic mountain men lurking among shadows, each agonizing step was another painful reminder that no matter what sinister horrors await us in the face of adversity, it isn't just about surviving, but living with those scars upon our consciousness for the rest, forevermore. Months have gone by since we stumbled upon that uncharted horror, but I still find it difficult to sleep through the night. I often find myself thinking of Bennett and others we lost, their lives cut short by the mountain men. I constantly wonder if there was anything we could have done to save them. We managed to escape, though the mental scars suffered that day will remain with us forever. The lives of those who didn't make it serve as a testament to the darkness that seethes just below civilization's veneer. As haunting as they may be, their sacrifices will never be forgotten. This happened to me several winters ago in a small town called Franklin in North Carolina. My name is Otis Seabrook, and at the time, I was visiting my friend Cletus Moorsfield. Our plan was to go on a hike through the Appalachian Mountains. My wife had just left me, and I thought that spending some time outdoors would take my mind off things. Cletus, another friend named Edwin Blickley and I, arrived at the trailhead early in the morning. The weather was chilly but bearable as the sun started to rise on the horizon. To lighten the mood, we exchanged jokes and reminisced about our college days. After some time, we veered off the main trail to explore a place Cletus discovered on one of his previous hikes. As we navigated the dense forest, we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite littered with torn clothing covered in patches of dried blood splatters. Unsettled by our gruesome discovery, we decided to head back to town immediately. On our way back, Edwin took a wrong turn and led us deeper into unfamiliar territory. We realized we were lost when nightfall approached faster than anticipated, yet we hadn't found our original path or any sign of civilization. While searching for a way out of the woods, someone suggested using their cell phone for help, only to find that our phones had no reception in this remote location. The realization that we couldn't call for help filled us with unease. The darkness intensified as shadows danced across our faces from the flickering light of our flashlights. We did our best not to panic but knew that something wasn't right when we heard strange noises echoing through the trees in the distance. Moving cautiously forward with increased vigilance and alertness, we scanned our surroundings for potential threats. Just then, we saw a figure lurking between trees several yards away, tall and emaciated, with unnaturally long limbs dressed in tattered clothes. It was like nothing we had ever seen before. As we crossed paths with this grotesque being, its filthy, matted hair covered much of its face, obscuring most of its features. The only visible part of its face, however, was its mouth, which revealed rows of sharp, jagged teeth stained a deep and morbid red. It stared at us and lunged with an eerie silence before disappearing into the darkness, leaving us shaken and terrified. 
heart pounding rapidly in my chest. I muttered a hasty prayer, hoping that we could evade this monstrous being. We tried picking up our pace but were unable to shake the sinister presence that seemed to haunt our every step. No matter how far or fast we moved, the figure always seemed close at hand. We came across several more deserted campsites with similar signs of a struggle, each one more disturbing than the last. Realizing that we were trapped in a deadly, riveting chase with a group of horrific predators lurking in the shadows sent cold shivers down our spines. Our once bearable hike now transformed into a nightmarish ordeal as every creak and rustle had us all on edge. It could have been another lurking predator or our own panicked breathing playing tricks. Our paranoia grew with each passing moment, consumed by fear, overthinking every leaf-strewn path in our attempts to find safety. Feeling utterly hopeless, Cletus couldn't contain his despair any longer and shouted into the night sky for someone, anyone, to rescue us from this horrifying predicament but his pleas fell on deaf ears as only silence answered his cry. Wordlessly, Edwin pulls out a pocket knife from his backpack and hands it to me. As I grasped the cold metal handle tightly, I understood that the only chance for survival was to confront these vicious beings head on. The air around us felt suffocating, heavy with dread as we fought against the sinking feeling that our impending fate would be joining other hikers as lifeless bodies buried deep within the wilderness. Although we tried to remain united and resilient under the weight of our ordeal, exhaustion started seeping in and cracks began to form within our group. We couldn't risk letting our defenses down, so we exchanged small jokes in hushed tones, anything to lift our spirits if even just for a moment. Suddenly, one of our group members, Tina, stopped dead in her tracks. Her eyes widened in terror as she noticed what seemed to be a signal from the lurking predators. Without hesitation, she urged everyone to climb the nearby trees as quickly as possible. As I scrambled up the tree with the knife clutched tightly in my hand, I glanced back and saw them. A group of wild-looking men with disheveled hair, ragged clothing, and crazed eyes. Their mouths were smeared with what appeared to be blood. Dread pooled within me as I realized... These were cannibalistic mountain men we had heard whispers about. From our concealed position within the trees, we could only watch in horror as they swarmed below us like a pack of wolves, salivating at the thought of their next meal. Desperation coiled in my chest, and even though I knew it was useless to yell for help, I couldn't resist trying one last time. Our screams echoed through the forest but were swallowed by its vastness. The mountain men began taunting us with guttural laughs and gruesome displays of violence. They mutilated small animals they found and then devoured them raw. Cletus lost his grip on both his sanity and the branch he was holding onto and tumbled down from his tree. Enraged, I brandished my knife, preparing to defend Cletus against these monstrous people. My heart pounded as I leapt down from the tree, ready to confront them or die trying. However, Edwin instinctively pulled me back up before I fully descended. We need a plan, he whispered urgently. Quickly realizing that confrontation would only put all our lives at risk, I nodded my agreement. We observed silently from our treetop perches as two of the mountain men circled Cletus's fallen form like predators around prey. They proceeded to restrain him with thick ropes and dragged him away into the depths of the forest. Determined to save Cletus despite our fear, we devised a plan. Edwin would create a distraction by navigating through the treetops and dropping heavy branches on their camp, while I would slip in from the opposing direction, aided by my pocket knife. Executing our plan without mistake, we managed to reach Cletus in time. We locked eyes as I cut through his bindings with my pocket knife. The expression on his face reflected his appreciation and sheer relief. As we made our escape, we encountered one of the mountain men. His face was contorted with rage as he saw us trying to flee with our friend. I raised my knife to defend us, but thankfully Edwin came to our rescue dropping a branch on the man's head at the perfect moment, knocking him unconscious. Breathing hard and adrenaline surging, 
we sprinted blindly through the forest. We frantically ran for hours, feeling like no amount of distance could put enough space between our relentless nightmare of an experience and ourselves. Eventually, exhausted beyond belief, we collapsed near a riverbank. By some stroke of sheer luck, after recovering from our exhaustion by the riverbank, we stumbled across a group of fellow hikers who managed to lead us back to civilization via a route they had been following that bypassed the mountain men's territory. We contacted authorities who later searched for the men in question, though ultimately they were never found. To this day, those chilling nights remain etched into our minds as reminders that there are genuine horrors lurking within nature's deceptive beauty. Years have passed since that harrowing experience in the woods. Cletus's life saved by our group's determination, wits, and friendship. Though forever grateful for our miraculous escape from evil's grasp that night, we couldn't help but shudder when recalling those cannibalistic mountain men whose grisly actions will haunt our darkest thoughts for all time. This happened to me nearly three summers ago. I was on a hike through the Appalachian Trail near Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. My name's Wilton Sands, and at the time, I worked as an accountant, desperately needing an escape from the city life. The trail was peaceful, and I struck up conversations with fellow hikers who shared tales of their trails. By the end of the day, we sat around a campfire as twilight set in. The fire crackled. One of the hikers, Letitia Kennerly, who was a local guide, recounted stories about murders and missing people in these woods. Skeptical seems to be your middle name, my fellow hiker Agrippa Mosby joked when he caught me rolling my eyes. Stories are stories, I shot back with a grin. But tomorrow's hike awaits us. The next afternoon found us in unfamiliar territory. We'd taken a wrong turn off the main path and were following what seemed to be an old logging route into dense woods. As we advanced deeper into the woods, we stumbled upon a disturbing sight. A makeshift camp with ragtag tents and what looked like human remains strewn around. They bore teeth marks. Some of my fellow hikers wanted to call for help, but realized they couldn't. There was no cell phone signal in this area. Terrified but determined to help those who might still be alive, Letitia took charge and led us carefully through the treacherous terrain. Our footsteps were slow as if weighed down by the horrors that cloaked our surroundings. We ventured farther from the campsite when we heard faint screams echoing through the trees. We hurried quietly towards them and found ourselves witnessing unspeakable horrors. A group of mountain men surrounded someone tied to a tree. They had bloodied mouths and knives glinting in their hands. Their intent was clear. Cannibalism. It was then that I took a good look at the one in charge. He was a disfigured, massive man with terrible burn marks scorched into his face, wearing what seemed like a patchwork of human flesh stitched together like a gruesome quilt. Agrippa whispered that they looked like the mountain men from local legends, but I still couldn't believe my eyes. Without time for further examination or thought, they saw us and snarled. Instinctively, we sprinted in different directions among the chaos leaving behind screams and gunshots that horrified and confused those who scattered. My heart pounding in my chest, I ran faster than ever before, barely avoiding obstacles in the dimming light. Suddenly, I heard cries for help and found Elima Stockfish, a member of our group, wounded and lying in a ditch, not far from another mutilated body. As blood trickled down Elimus's shirt and he struggled to speak coherently through the pain, he handed me his gun, a battered revolver with only one bullet left. A shiver ran down my spine as I took it reluctantly. It's all that's left, Elimas muttered between ragged breaths. Give him hell for Lavina. We'll find help, I reassured him before leaving him in search of safety. Minutes stretched to hours as I continued on my journey upwards. It felt as if there were eyes on me everywhere the mountain men lurking just out of sight, their presence building dread within me at every turn. At last, 
I reached an old fire tower in an open area high above tree line, my best hope for signaling help. With trembling hands, I managed to light a signal fire using some wood and gasoline found amidst the storage inside the tower. The wind carried smoke high above the trees. This had to be enough to signal for help. Adrenaline and dread churned within me, as did the knowledge that the mountain men could be here any minute. As I stood watch near my signal fire, my ears picked up distant footsteps, many of them. I knew I had to do something. I could not stay at the fire tower and wait for the mountain men to find me. If help did not come, I needed a plan. Clutching the revolver with its single bullet, I gritted my teeth and focused on coming up with a strategy to survive. While exploring the fire tower, I stumbled across a map that detailed the area. The high elevation granted me an advantage of seeing a wide expanse of the terrain. From my vantage point, I spotted what appeared to be an abandoned logging road on the opposite side of the mountain, an escape route. Desperation and fear pushed me to make my decision. Abandoning my signal fire, I armed myself with some leftover wood as a makeshift weapon alongside the revolver Elemis gave me. Leaving only a note with my plan carved into it, I set off for the logging road. The journey was fraught with danger. Branches snatched at my clothes and skin while jagged rocks threatened to catch my footing. The distant sounds of footsteps never ceased. Constant reminders that the mountain men were close behind. Yet, without much choice, I trudged onward. Time seemed to slow as exhaustion racked my body. But finally, after hours of trekking, I made it to the abandoned logging road. The path twisted into the mountainside as it wound its way downhill, a lifeline away from certain death. However, fate was far from merciful to me. While cautiously making my way down the narrow path, glimpses of movement ahead alerted me that something dangerous approached. One of these cannibalistic hunters had found me first. Seeing that I had nowhere left to run or hide, I readied myself for confrontation. Sweat dripped down my forehead as blood pounded in my ears. Heavy breaths, filled with dread, echoed in tandem with each heart-pounding moment. The mountain man broke through the cover of trees, giving me a good glimpse of him. Standing taller than most men and covered in unkempt hair, he bore scars that seemed to have a life of their own. Despite his monstrous appearance, something in his eyes revealed his humanity. A deeply rooted, twisted desire to hunt kill and consume was what pushed him forward. The look was unmistakably chilling. He charged at me with a sharpened stick, his weapon of choice. Despite my fear, I managed to parry his attack with the wood I gripped defensively. After a few close calls and intense struggle, an opportunity presented itself. While the mountain man reeled from a particularly powerful swing that connected with his arm, I took aim at him with the revolver. The gunshot echoed through the valley as the bullet struck its mark. The mountain man fell to the ground with a guttural exhale. But my victory was short-lived. Without warning, several more mountain men stepped out from cover around me. They examined their fallen comrade but didn't seem to care about his demise. Panicking and desperate for any chance of escape, I took advantage of their momentary distraction. With a combination of adrenaline and instinct guiding me, I sprinted down the logging road knowing full well it might be leading me straight into a trap. As I raced down the path, the sun dipped below the horizon. However, I could not afford to stop even for a moment's rest. Suddenly, I heard helicopters in the distance. Their powerful searchlights scanned the terrain below. In an incredible stroke of luck or divine intervention, my signal fire had worked after all. The glare from one searchlight found its way through the dark trees and swept across me as I stumbled onto an open spot by an abandoned logging camp, all within view of my pursuers, who stopped short at the tree line. Help! Over here! I shouted to gain their attention before collapsing to the ground, completely exhausted. The maniacal laughter of the mountain men rang in my ears as they retreated back into the darkness and disappeared from sight. I caught a brief look, and their faces still haunt me. Yet, through it all, 
I knew I survived and would help Elemis find justice for Lavina.